Welcome to the first episode of the Live Open Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Live Open Mike. The plan, fingers crossed, is to come at you five days a week, Monday through Friday, going over all the news that's fit to print about virtual, mixed, and augmented reality, gaming, tech, and all of my freezing cold takes, because you should never, ever consider anything I say a hot take. We'll also have interviews with people around this community, content creators, editors, and journalists, developers, and so on and so forth. First topic I want to hit today is the Quest 3 update for Asgard's Wrath 2. Uh, I'm totally biased here. Asgard's Wrath 2 is my favorite VR game ever made. I'm someone who grew up playing RPGs, uh, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest slash Dragon Warrior, dungeon crawlers like Shadowgate and The Legend of Zelda. So so this is right up my alley. There aren't a whole lot of games in VR like this, especially at this scale with this many things to do. I've put well over 100 hours into the game and I've barely touched the roguelite mode, just playing through the story mode, going through 100%. The Quest 3 texture update, something that we've been waiting on for a while, has been teased in their Discord and on their social media. The reaction to the Quest 3 update has been pretty mixed. There are a lot of people, if you go through their Discord and social media and subreddits, saying, I don't see a difference. I don't understand how we got here. I thought it'd be a lot bigger than this. And to kind of understand why people are saying that, you need to understand how we got here. So let's go through the history of this game. Asgard's Wrath 2 was first announced during the Metagaming Showcase in June of 2023. Earlier that day on Instagram, of all places, Mark Zuckerberg officially announced the MetaQuest 3. Uh, there was a teaser for that. It was about 30 seconds long. I guess they wanted to get that announcement out of the way because it was right around Apple's WWDC where they're going to unveil the Apple Vision Pro. And they wanted people to know that the new hardware was indeed coming this fall. So they opened up the game for pre-orders. And if you pre-order, you got a special Guardian skin for it. And then about a month later, they announced that if you pre-order the Quest 3, you were going to get Asgard's Wrath 2 for free, and you will also get the first Asgard's Wrath, all 150 gigabytes of that game on PC VR. The caveat is that Quest 3 launched in October, but Asgard's Wrath 2 wasn't going to come out until December, so you had to wait two months to play the free game that you got with your new headset. Fast forward to December, the game comes out, people start playing it, and myself, like a lot of people, were just kind of blown away by what the game was, how it looked. This game was setting a new benchmark for what standalone VR could do. But it was very, very clear to a lot of people that it was still basically built on a Quest 2 build. Uh, it was running at 72 hertz, not 90 hertz. The developers said it was supposed to be at 90, but when people were putting their performance meters and playing through the game, 72 was the main refresh rate they were getting. And then like some textures look fuzzy, some things look blurry. You could just tell that because they had been working on that game since 2020, which is right around the time the Quest 2 came out, that they had optimized that game to push the Quest 2 as hard as they could possibly push it. But now Quest 3 is out, it's 30% more powerful, and my guess is that they didn't get their Quest 3 dev kit early enough in the process, or they were still in quality assurance with Asgard's Wrath 2, uh, to be able to have Quest 3 enhanced features at launch. So the developers, they were listening to feedback, you can go through it in their Discord, on their social media, they said basically, hey, we heard you, we're going to give you some Quest 3 features right away, and then we're going to work on a bigger Quest 3 update down the line. So later in that month, they patched the game, and we got two new features. One was a toggle to lock the game at 90 hertz instead of it going back and forth between 90 and 72. The other just said enhanced features. What that did was it raised the render resolution from a Quest 2 level to a Quest 3 level. That was readily apparent the second you turned it on. It also increased the LOD, that's the level of detail distance, or draw distance is what a lot of people call that. So you can see things off in the distance um, further out before they will pop in. If you turn that feature off, you would kind of have to maybe walk closer to a mountain before you see the mountain pop in in front of you. The 90 hertz refresh rate was pretty nice, but it actually increased the amount of pop in that happened. So you kind of to play with those two toggles back and forth to really get a nice sharp picture, whatever your preference was. So now fast forward to May, the developers are in their Discord saying, we're hoping to get this texture pack out in May, but it may be in June. And then last week of May, they finally get it out. Upload VR has a great article that I'll link down in the show notes. If you're watching the video version of this on YouTube or on Spotify, I'm going to put some of the pictures up as I continue to talk through this. And it's just showing the details before and after. You can see some of the fine granular detail in something like the walls, the sand, uh, some of the creature models. There's a great shot of the Death Stalker, which is a scorpion you fight out in the Great Sand Sea. That's a desert area, the first major area of the game. And you can see a lot more detail has been put into it. They raised the texture resolution a lot, but a lot of people were saying when they're just playing the game through casually that they're not seeing anything. And this is where I think Sansa Root games were kind of like a victim of their own success. Like I said earlier, this game absolutely pushes the boundaries of what's possible in standalone VR. And that kind of works against them. Also, that first update they put out in December that I talked about works against them too. As I was right too, before any of the enhancements was already one of the best looking standalone VR games ever made. You can argue the only game that was in its category is probably Red Matter 2. 
So it's already pushing the limits of what the Quest 2 could do with the Quest 3 not being like a generational leap forward, just like a, a step forward, 30% more power, the chip, so on and so forth. There was only so much more they're going to be able to do because they didn't have as much of a jump to do. Contrast that with something like the Saints and Sinners pack, for instance. Saints and Sinners 1, when that game was first ported down from PC VR, was optimized for Quest 1. And if you play the original version of that game, you see it. It's a great game. It's one of my favorite games. I'd argue it's one of the best VR games ever made. But on Quest 1, it looked really, really ugly. There's no way the Quest 1 can handle things like shadows, dynamic lighting, any of the flying textures on the zombies. So everything just looked really, really blocky. And that anti-aliasing in that game is way up. You play the game on Quest 2, you saw that too. So even though the render resolution was a little bit better, it still was not a great looking game on standalone VR. So when Skydance Interactive releases their Quest 3 update, you're taking the game that was optimized and built for Quest 1 and bumping it all the way up to Quest 3. So you're basically jumping two generations. The difference in that was night and day. Asgard's Wrath 2 is a different case because it was already at the very, very edge of what the last generation could do. So you're not taking as much of a jump forward. If you ever play games on PC, if you go into the graphic settings, you'll see graphic presets and it'll be things like low, medium, high, and like ultra or epic or something like that. I think for Asgard's Wrath 2, this is the equivalent of going from like low to medium or medium to high, basically taking one step forward. Whereas for something like Saints and Sinners and a lot of other games are like this, they're going from like low to high or like low to epic or medium to epic, something like that. They're basically taking two or three jumps as opposed to just one jump. So the differences are more readily apparent. For Asgard's Wrath 2, if you really want to see how different the game is from Quest 2 to Quest 3, I advise you do what I did. I grabbed my Quest 2. I have a 64 gigabyte Quest 2, so I had to wipe almost everything off of it to get the game on there. So I have to wait in something like five hours for that whole game to download and run. Pop the game on, put in my Quest 2, and the downgrade was absolutely immediate. Uh, even at 72 hertz, I was noticing a lot more popping. Everything looked blurry. The textures didn't look great. I think because I had played the entire game on Quest 3 already, and I took that render resolution bump when that option was available, um, I didn't appreciate what was already there, but playing the game on Quest 2 and then going back, the differences was like, it was really, really night and day. It was really easy to see that. So if you're saying that the texture pack wasn't enough, pop on your Quest 2, take a look at it there, and then play on your Quest 3, and I think you'll really see the difference. So I can understand why people were upset with this update and they thought the devs didn't do enough, but if you play the game on last generation hardware and then you play the current generation of it, you will absolutely see the differences. So take that device, give it a shot on Quest 2, come back to your Quest 3, you'll see a massive, massive change. Second topic I wanted to hit was the Sony State of Play for PSVR 2. This just happened on Thursday. Most of these State of Plays from Sony, it's it's almost like a pattern at this point. You go into some PSVR 2 subreddits, some discords I'm in, and people in that crowd will go, okay, well, I hope we get this, I hope we get this. I remember the first State of Play after PSVR 2 came out, people were like, we're gonna get Spider-Man VR, we're gonna get Last of Us VR, we're gonna get all the major franchises coming into VR from Sony, all their first party franchises, this is gonna be the greatest thing ever. You don't really see that anymore. I think people have kind of just realized that Sony isn't going to do all of that. But the controversy around this one was a few days before that, a rumor started going around that there was gonna be a new Astro Bot coming to PlayStation and it was not gonna be VR compatible. This was a bit of a kick to the face for PlayStation VR fans because Astro Bot originally started as a VR game, supporting it to flat and not continuing VR support was really gonna be an insult and kind of like a signal to how much Sony really cares about the PSVR 2. So stay the play starts, you go through a whole bunch of flat games that a lot of people really weren't super interested in if you're in the VR community. And then we got two back-to-back -back trailers. The first one was for Behemoth. I was actually really happy to see this because the first trailer for Skydance's Behemoth was a cinematic trailer. It didn't show you any gameplay whatsoever. It was pretty much just a teaser and we really wanted to know what the gameplay loop was gonna look like. This one was all gameplay. The game looked pretty damn good. It looked like a mix between Shadow of the Colossus and like a Souls-like game. Combat looked pretty fluid. Uh, there's these gigantic creatures that are trying to step on you. Really looking forward to that game. I'm happy with what we got there. The second trailer was a teaser for the Aliens game from Survivals. Didn't really give a lot. The frame rate didn't look great. It looked almost like found footage from like a head cam or something like that. But uh, gay spooky vibes. You're walking around with a flashlight. You see an alien crawl across the ceiling. Then you see another alien jump at you. That's it. It was less than 30 seconds. But but the wet appetite kind of gave us enough to at least get us excited because what we saw looked pretty good. And then there was nothing. And there were more flat screen games. And then fast forward to the end. And the best looking trailer in this entire state of play was the Astrobot trailer. It was bright, it was colorful, it was fun, it was silly, it was everything that you love about Astro. And then at the very end, it flashes coming soon to PS5. 
and the community absolutely blew up and I don't blame them. I've done at least a couple of videos on my YouTube channel, basically saying I feel sorry for PSVR 2 fans. I think the last one I did was after Hellsweeper VR came out. They were expecting when they bought that headset to get like high fidelity games left and right. And it's coming to light that you're not going to get top end graphics on that headset unless the developers put in eye track dynamic foveated rendering. Now there's a whole conversation, a bunch of technical reasons about why developers are not putting that into their games. To keep it short and not get too technical, if the game is made in Unity, most developers were on the standard Unity pipeline which did not support dynamic foveated rendering. They had to switch their game to a new pipeline called the Universal Rendering Pipeline, URP for short, and doing that for a lot of developers meant basically breaking their game entirely, moving it over to the new pipeline, and then doing a whole other round of quality assurance. Not every developer has the time and resources to be able to do that right away, especially if they're trying to get their game out on time. They might have investors or publishers they are expecting them to hit a specific target date and or this game might be on multiple platforms. So you're also dealing with QA for Quest, you're dealing with QA for PC VR and devoting that to PSVR 2. They just didn't have time to do all that. So a lot of developers were coming back after the fact, just like with Quest 3 updates and doing uh, dynamic foveated rendering to make the game look a lot better, a lot sharper. Uh, Hellsweeper did this, No Man's Sky. There's, there's a bunch of examples of developers going back and adding that feature later. If the game is built in Unreal Engine, you really had to be on Unreal Engine 5 to be able to take advantage of DFR. Unreal 4 doesn't support eye track dynamic foveated rendering. So again, if you're on Unreal, if you're on Unreal 4, you had to break your game, move it to Unreal 5, which that's a lot of like learning headaches and things like that. Developers aren't used to that new system. So again, just like Unity, you had to break your game if you're on Unreal 4 to move it to Unreal 5, go through a whole bunch of testing. That's a process that could take months, if not a year, if you were still on the old version of the engine and you were trying to come up to the new version. X Real Games has an excellent developer's diary on their YouTube channel for their upcoming game, Zero Caliber 2. And in that, they talked about the fact that they weren't going to be able to support dynamic foveated rendering right away without, again, breaking their game and redoing it. And that was going to cost them months, if not a year of development for a studio that small and not being able to bring in revenue with the new game that would honestly bankrupt them. And a lot of developers are in that same boat. So bringing it all back to Astrobot, this is just another example of PSVR 2 owners Having like a certain expectation, well, it makes sense that Astro Bot, which started as a VR game, would have PSVR 2 support, right? Right? Apparently not. I guess Sony just doesn't see the return on investment important at the VR. It wouldn't surprise me if Astro Bot got a VR mode, but it just wouldn't be available at launch. Maybe it comes out six months to a year later. Sony has this thing where they'll put out the game exclusively on PS5 and then eventually move it to other platforms that they're not going to make as much money on, like PC, like VR after they've already exhausted like the, the big release window, the hype window on their specific console. So it's got the habit of doing this. Ghost of Tsushima, for instance, just came out on PC. The game came out on PS5 a long time ago. Both Horizon games were delayed PC releases. Uh, both Spider-Man games, Spider-Man 2 has been out on PS5 for a while, but it's probably not gonna hit PC until 2025, most likely. Miles Morales was late. The first Spider-Man game was late. So they have an established pattern of delaying the releases on other platforms. This may be the same thing. So I'm not giving up hope. I can see Astrobot getting the PSVR 2 VR mode, but it will be, I don't know, let's say six months after the game launches on PS5, which means a lot of people will have already played it, including people that have PSVR 2 and maybe they won't want to revisit it. And then you end up in a situation like Resident Evil 4 Remake was where Gamertag had the post on his Twitter about a month or so after that VR mode came out, only 50,000 people had played the VR version of the game, which was a really sad number given how many people own PSVR 2s and own that game entirely. Last topic for the day is No Man's Sky's new expedition. It is titled Adrift. No Man's Sky is one of the bigger games you can play in VR. That game has endless, endless content. Uh, it came out in 2018 and six years later, Hello Games is still supporting it with updates and more importantly, they're big believers in VR. Fingers crossed their new game, Light No Fire, also has a VR mode that's supposed to be out later this year. We're really hoping for that. For those of you listening on audio, I'm going to read the description so you know what's coming. For our next update, we wanted to allow players to experience an alternative universe. We're calling it a drift, and for the first time, players can be truly alone in No Man's Sky. We think it's a special feeling. Removing other life forms means no shops, no trading, no shortcuts, and no help, providing a very different survival experience. This alternative universe is more dangerous too, with sandworms now roaming free and fiend decks spreading across the planet. Buildings are broken and rusted, a few remaining landmarks the graves of lost travelers. In space, a new ghostly frigate beckons, allowing players to recruit a piece of this lonely universe. To help provide safe haven is a new bulky hauler starship called the Iron Vulture. Since we added ship customization in our last update, we're also seeding the game with lots of new customization options and a drift. 
Adrift was supposed to be our next expedition, which it is, but it's ballooned out to an update filled with improvements, new unique gameplay content, and rewards. I haven't had the chance to jump into this myself, but I've had a couple of friends who are big No Man's Sky fans that were playing this right away. They said it was kind of feature incomplete in a way, uh, even though they're correct. If you go to a space station, everything's empty. You can still see some remnants of other travelers. You can still see the fact that some NPCs are still there. It just feels like maybe like the visualization of them is turned off and you don't feel truly alone. I have seen some of the frigate they're talking about. It looks like you're wandering through a ghost ship. That part's really well done and it's spooky, but you could also do that in the main game. If you went to an abandoned ship in the middle of space already, you already kind of got that experience without this update being available. So reactions to it have so far been mixed. I'm hoping to jump in this week and I'll be able to give you more hands-on impressions of it. So far, I've just watched some friends who streamed the game on Twitch go through it themselves and kind of gotten their takes. And that's a wrap for the first episode of Live Open Daily. If you enjoyed this, you already know what to do. Like, share, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. You can also catch me on the artist for me alone this Twitter, X. I'm at Live Open Mike over there. And catch me on Twitch. I'm at Live Open Mike on Twitch. I stream VR there at least every Tuesday and Thursday night. I'm starting to sprinkle some Splat games in there. But guaranteed, Tuesday and Thursday are always going to be VR. Take care of yourselves, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.